I'm Eric Wishhouse, and I'm a HHMI uh, investigator and a professor at Princeton University. And my laboratory works on, on the way embryos develop. I'm particularly interested in the gene activities and the cell biological processes that operate in the very early embryo to transform what seems to us like a simple, freshly fertilized egg into a complex organism with cells and uh, all in the right place, cells with particular morphologies and, and particular organs all in the right place at the right time. Now, these processes are interesting to all of us, I think, especially in, in, with respect to human development because we're all interested in where it is that we come from, how is it that we're a single cell is able to give rise to something as complex as you or I. But over the past 20 years, we've also learned that almost that all these processes that occur in embryonic development, all the gene activities and all the cell, the shell shape changes and the controls of cell adhesion and uh, uh, the cytoskeleton cell structure that one sees happening and can follow and study in embryos are the same kinds of processes and involve the same kind of molecules that operate throughout uh, the life of almost all organisms. And so one of the goals of our work is not just to understand how embryos develop, but to understand how cells and living organisms control their gene activity, how they control their cell shape, how they control all these processes that are essential for life, not only the embryo and for embryonic development, but for everything that we see today. So what I'm going to talk to you about in my lectures, uh, my basic plan is that what I'd like to do is to first describe to you a little bit about how the fruit fly embryo, which is the embryo that we work on in the lab, develops, and point out to you some of the really interesting features that have made this embryo really helpful, and really uh, a powerful tool for understanding development. And then in the second part of, the, of my uh, talk, what I'll do is focus in on one particular question, which is how is it that in an embryo cells come to achieve uh, different fates, different patterns of gene activity? How do cells come to be different from each other? Where does that pattern arise? And as you'll see, we'll start from a basic description of the process and then work our way through uh, gene activities and, cell and, uh, and, and basic cellular functions. But where we'd really like to end up with is a, a deeper, almost biophysical understanding of these processes. And that's my goal. And then what I'd like to do is to also expand back out and talk about embryonic development, talk about it in the context of not just fruit fly embryos, but more broadly of all organisms on this earth and how processes evolve and change, have changed during the history of life on this earth. Okay, so the very first slide though, and to begin what I wanted to do is just to show you uh, an image of a Drosophila embryo. This is a scanning EM. It's a fruit fly egg or a Drosophila egg uh, almost immediately after fertilization. It's still a single cell. It's about maybe half a millimeter or 500 microns long. You look at the surface, you don't see anything very much. If you were able to look inside, you'd see that in this zone here, there's a, a, the nucleus of the single cell, which is the product of the, fertile, uh, of the fusion of the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus. You look at it, and it doesn't really look very interesting. The amazing thing, though, is that what, the, and what this embryo has to do to become interesting is to convert from being a single cell into a multicellular organism where individual cells can be, uh, can assume different fates and begin to do different things. Now, one of the interesting things about fly uh, embryonic development in Drosophila is that the embryo is able to do this extraordinarily rapidly, such that after two and a half hours, this single cell has now transformed itself into a multicellular organism with now 6,000 cells, about 100 cells along the anterior uh, what's the future head, future tail, anterior, posterior axis of the embryo. And the way that it's able to do this transformation so rapidly is that what it's done is that unlike most other organisms where when cells divide and replicate, you have a DNA replication and a mitosis and that's followed by cell division. In Drosophila, during the early stages of development, these mitotic divisions, these replications of, of nuclei, occur without cell division, such that an individual 
a fertilized egg, which starts out with a fused of the single nucleus, goes after one mitotic cycle, goes from one nuclei to two nuclei. The cycles are synchronous, so the nuclei divide again without cell division, so that you have from two nuclei to four nuclei, eight nuclei. And what happens after about an hour and a half to two hours is that through a, a sequence of 13 of these synchronous rounds of nuclear replication, the embryo is now still a single cell, but it's a single cell with 6,000 nuclei in the surface. And amazingly then, at that point, these mitotic divisions temporarily stop, and at, it's only at that point that the cytoskeleton and the membrane synthesis is reorganized in this embryo to now make new membrane and uh, such that membrane can be pulled down, plasma membrane can be pulled down between individual nuclei to separate them or partition them into individual cells. And it's after that process that's called cellularization that the embryo has now converted itself from one cell into an embryo with multiple cells, 6,000 cells. And it's only at that point that those cells can begin that when you have individual cells, that those cells can begin to become different from each other and show distinct behaviors that are ultimately related to their fates, skin or muscle. Now, there's one other thing that's really interesting about this phase, and that's that if you look at the early stages, when the embryo is undergoing these rapid mitotic divisions, all the gene products that it needs, all the proteins and all the RNAs, are supplied by the embryo's mother are put into the egg, unfertilized egg, before fertilization. And what the embryo is doing is just going through a cyclic pattern of DNA replication and mitosis, doing the same thing over and over again using the same gene products, these gene products that are supplied by the mother. What happens at, uh, once those repetitive cycles are done and the embryo wants to do something new or different, is that it begins to transcribe its own genomes. It begins to make what we call zygotic RNAs and zygotic proteins. And so at this point, it becomes very, then a very interesting point for us in development. Because initially, up for these first two and a half hours, the embryo has been doing something repetitive over and over with using only maternally supplied gene products. And then the sense is that when it begins to transcribe its own genes and transcribe specific genes, uh, that are required ultimately to do new things, to go on to the next step in development. So the sense that this stage becomes really important for us, for our, for us to look at because it marks a stage not only where something new begins to happen, you stop mitosis, you begin to change, cells begin to become distinct from each other, but it's also associated with adding new gene products. Now, what I'd like to, though, just continue on with the description of development, keep, for you to keep in mind, though, that now what we're going to be looking at is some, begins to reflect the active contribution of gene uh, in the embryo itself. What happens between these two stages, you go from uniform behaviors to distinct cellular behaviors. You can see that again in looking at the scanning EMs that we have here. This is, again, the embryo that I showed you before with 6,000 cells, 100 cells, all, arranged along the anterior posterior axis, all the cells look pretty much the same. If I'd fixed this embryo for scanning M about five minutes later, what you would have seen is that now all of the cells in the embryo are no longer the same shape. There are clearly distinct things happening. There's an area here that's ultimately going to form the head of the embryo that's uh, marked off by this fold that's called the cephalic or head fold from the rest of the embryo. There are other things beginning to happen in the embryo. Clearly, by this stage, at this point, five, ten minutes later, the cells are marking their, their, their uh, showing distinct behaviors and showing how, how, how different they are. We can actually watch these behaviors in living embryos by tagging the surfaces of cells with uh, uh, fusion proteins between GFP and various membrane proteins so we can follow individual cell shapes. And we watch this movie again, which you can see. This is again the blastoderm stage that we talked about. And watch in this area here. All the cells are pretty much the same, but right about there you can begin to see this fold happening. And then you begin to see remarkable changes in the behaviors of cells. You can see this movement of cells as they sweep and move around the uh, 
the post uh, uh, move around the end of the embryo. Obviously, as you watch the process, and we'll watch it one more time, uh, all the cells are the same. Individual cells begin to become distinct and with extraordinary reproducible patterns. So it's embryos always make a head. They always make a head right here. They're always separated by folds. This behavior here, these cells here that are moving into this imagination here, are ultimately going to form the, the endodermal or, or gut regions of the embryo. We could roll this embryo over, and now we can watch from the ventral side, and we'll con see, we see that other things are going on. You can actually see a little bit of this head fold here, but what's more striking in this, in this movements of cells Again, watch right here, you see a fold forming. These are future muscle cells that are going to be brought into the interior of the embryo because obviously that's what you want, the embryo wants to have muscles. Now, by looking at embryos and characterizing the behaviors of individual cells and the overall changes in morphology and the behaviors of individual cells, what we've learned is that all major morphological changes all growth, all changes in the visible appearance of the embryos uh, involve local changes in cell shape. The initial changes occur without any cell division. There's no growth. There's no uh, mitosis anymore after these first uh, initial uh, 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 cell divisions. The embryo will begin mitosis later, but at this stage, these major changes that we saw in the movie are all happening because individual cells in specific places change their shape, say, from being long and square to being uh, rounded up. And it's that kind of cell shape change that produces the, ultimately the changes that we see here uh, that, say, separate the future head from the tail of the embryo. So what we want to know is why is it that certain cells and only certain cells in certain places change their shape and others not. We know that those cell shape changes correlate with patterns of gene expression. So that if we go back to this head fold here, where that's separating the, um, that's fold that separates the head from the rest of the embryo, we can look and see there's actually a small number of cells, a single number of row of cells that are making the fold. And there are genes that are expressed exactly in stripes in this embryo that have just begun to be transcribed at this stage that we talked about before, at this stage right when the embryo has completed the mitotic divisions uh, that precede the, be the cell behaviors and mark the, uh, the infolding of these cells. So the cells that are going to change their shape right here are cells, for example, that in, the, uh, in this way are expressing the uh, that are the cells that are not expressing the green gene here, which is a gene called paired, or the orange gene, which is a gene called uh, runt. And so there are specific patterns of gene expression, of transcription, that have arisen at this stage, 20 minutes before the cells have begun to change shape, that direct the cells and control their cell behaviors. But all that does is, of course, just push the, uh, the, the, the question back. You want to know why it is that cells shows why it is that cells in a given region of an embryo show particular patterns of cell behavior, particular shapes, and now I tell you, well, that's because they're expressing different gene products. That doesn't really answer the question because what you really want to know is how is it that spatial and, and temporal patterns of gene uh, expression are established at the blastoderm stage. And we'll go back again to this central idea that it's at this stage, the onset. Uh, right before gastrulation, right before these cell shape changes begin to occur, that individual uh, uh, genes come to be expressed in the embryo in specific patterns. But I indicated that before that stage, cell behaviors were uniform, and maternal RNAs and proteins, uh, and they depend on maternal RNAs. And most of those maternal RNAs and proteins, and actually for a long time we thought all of them, were uniformly distributed throughout the egg. But what we've learned now is that we have to put the emphasis on mostly. Uh, these R maternal RNAs and proteins that are supplied and necessary during these early stages are mostly uniform, but there's a very small number of proteins, 
and RNAs that are put into the egg by the mother and show distinct patterns of distribution. And one of the most important of these, and this will be important for the remainder of my talk, is a protein called bicoid. It's a transcription factor supplied by the mother. It's present during these early stages. And if you look at its distribution in the embryo, early embryo, you can see that this protein is localized at high concentrations at the anterior end of the egg, the future head region of the egg, and then grades off in a posterior, uh, grades off uh, in, in cells as we move more and more posterior in the embryo. And one of the things we've learned and that I'll tell you more about is the controlling role for this protein distribution in establishing the patterns of gene expression and transcription that occur at these stages, at this process right before gastrulation, and that are responsible for the cell shape changes. Now, what's really going to be a, a central to the problem is that if it's, we have a graded distribution of a protein, a maternal protein in the egg, that the a protein that the mother has directly or indirectly has put into the egg, how does that uh, distribution of the maternal bicoid protein established? How is it formed? And from wonderful experiments by uh, Christian and Saint Volhard, Wolfgang Drever, and a number of other laboratories, we've learned that what's central here is that this protein gradient that we can see in this uh, embryo here, it's about two hours old, arises because, not because the mother puts the protein into the egg and not because she puts the protein in a graded fashion, but instead what she does is that when she's making the egg, back in the ovary, back long before fertilization, when she was making the egg, she deposits the RNA that encodes this protein and anchors it to the cytoplasm, the anterior end of the egg. This RNA is not is not translated during oogenesis. As long as she's holding this egg, as long as the egg is not fertilized, the RNA sits there in an inactive form. When the egg is fertilized, one, of the, one consequence of fertilization or activation of this egg is that this RNA is released from its anchor and begins to be translated. And because the protein is not anchored, the protein is thought to diffuse from this source of synthesis, continue to make protein constantly here from the RNA that's localized here, but the protein diffuses. And what's established over time in these first two hours is a gradient of bicoid, of this transcription factor bicoid. What then happens is that this, uh, that ultimately, this is a little cartoon diagram, uh, that the highest concentrations of the bicoid protein will be at the anterior end of the egg. The concentration will fall. This is a transcription factor, and there are genes it, in the uh, embryo that are going to become transcriptionally active at this, this time. This is the stage where trans major transcriptional activation occurs in the embryo. But that this, uh, but those genes are activated by bicoid as a transcription factor in a concentration dependent way. So there are certain genes, for example, like the hunchback gene that are activated by relatively higher concentrations of bicoid protein and so show a boundary of show expression only in the anterior most 48% uh, of the egg. As you can see here, there are other genes which are, can be activated by lower thresholds, for example, the cripple gene shown here. And that, that gene, um, the cripple gene then, and the hunchback gene define domains of gene expression. Are the, are the genes, in fact, the, that are expressed in the embryo and are involved in establishing those spatial patterns. Now, that understanding of development was quite remarkable, something uh, that the role of maternal RNAs and maternal proteins, because it was the first such maternal RNA which was functionally uh, demonstrated to provide this gradient-like form of information to uh, across the whole embryo. Discovered by Christiane Nussheim-Volhard, Wolfgang Griever, more than 50 years ago, 
had an extraordinary impact in developmental biology and uh, understanding of, uh, of the processes of embryonic development. And that's why, and created a great deal of excitement. You can always ask sometimes, why was that result so exciting? What was so important about it? And so I think there are a couple of interesting things that happen. If you look at the model that you have a, a maternal, a graded maternal protein that is, uh, controls transcription by uh, defined, by uh, having downstream targets, genes activated in a concentration dependent way at specific thresholds, you establish a pattern of gene expression. But what it's really telling us is that in biology, information is quantitative. It's not that you, that even people had speculated that mothers may put gene products in the egg to establish pattern. No one knew what the nature of that maternal information was. What these experiments are telling us is that information in biology is largely quantitative. That cells make choices based on levels or concentrations of picoid protein. And what that does is it also tells us that the choice process depends not just on concentration levels, but on the ability of nuclei or cells to measure concentration and make permanent, permanent cell choices in response to those measured concentrations. So one of the things we'll talk about is how is it? What do we know about cells? What are, the, what are these measurements? What are they really, how do they actually work? Is this the right way of thinking about the process? What are the problems thinking about the process? But what the experiments did is that by emphasizing the quantitative nature of information, they changed how a developmental biologist thought about the process of development. Another interesting thing, if you go back and look at the process and think about how it is that um, the big white gradient is itself established, how does it you, uh, provide information to an embryo? The initial localization, the initial pattern is a localized RNA which is very finely and, and uh, but is localized to the anterior end. There's not a lot of information in a simple localization of a single molecule in a single place. What's important is that the final, that is, we'll say that the information-rich distribution that the cells are going to use to make de developmental choices is not that initial distribution, but the final uh, distribution is achieved by simple physical parameters. You localize an RNA, and then when that RNA begins to make a protein, the protein diffuses. And if you think in terms of what kinds of things can impact on that, things like how fast do molecules move, how fast are they degraded, all those things will ultimately set up and define what the pattern of distribution is. All those things are potentially measurable. So what's exciting about having a cartoon picture of a localized RNA and a protein gradient is that we believe that once you have that, car once you have that cartoon in your head, you can, it directs you to say, well, what is interesting? If we want to test this, can we actually measure diffusion constants? Can we actually measure degradation? Can we actually test the model? Can we test the model as a biologist? Can we test the model by defining the biophysical parameters associated with the generation of biological information? And lastly, though, uh, and there's one other interesting point that I didn't took me a very long time to appreciate about this uh, about this model, but I think it's really really essential, is that after Bicoid was discovered and uh, the remarkable initial characterization. The expectation was, uh, it was at a time where we were coming to realize as molecular biologists that most of the genes and most of the processes that one sees, say, in one species or in one organism, most of those same genes are also found in other organisms and they probably also function in much the same way. So there was initially an expectation that the bicoid protein, given its predominant and central role, the central role that it plays in uh, governing embryo embryonic development in Drosophila uh, 
given its importance that one would quickly identify uh, similar proteins in uh, uh, the, the Bikoi gene in the frog or the Bikoi gene in, in, in humans, maybe even. And, and what's remarkable, and what was unexpected at the time, was that in contrast to many genes that are conserved to a high degree of fidelity across all species, Bicoid protein in the Bicoid gene is a fairly new invention, meaning that even if you look in other insects, even if you look in other diptera, other flies, you don't find the Bicoid, uh, the Bicoid protein. Bicoid evolved at a point in the history or the evolution of the, of the, of the higher flies as a new gene, a new solution to a problem that must have been old and has always existed for all embryos, because all embryos want to know, have to be able to establish pattern. But what's interesting then about this particular problem, about, about Bicoid, is that it's not conserved. It's a new solution to a, a fundamental developmental problem. And so on the one hand, that's interesting because you could say, well, how is it that organisms in the course of their evolution establish new problems and uh, new, new solutions? Why do they do that? But what's the nature of those new solutions? The other interesting thing, the question that then though arises from the uh, evolution of Picoid is that although we said that Picoid is a fairly recent evolution among the diptera, there are a number of flies, as we'll see, that you have from the point where uh, Bicoid was established as a patterning mechanism, have a, a number of, of flies, uh, uh, species that have continued to use Bicoid, and those species have evolved in other ways. As you'll see, they make big eggs and small eggs. And so what becomes really interesting about Bicoid is how is it during the course of evolution when a new solution arises, Bicoid protein, how is it after an organism or a group of organisms chooses that solution. How is it that during the course of further evolution that solution is modified or changed or adapted to make it suitable as the individual organisms e evolve and radiate and establish themselves into different niches? And so Bitcoin, I believe, ultimately from the standpoint of evolution, is really an interesting, provides an interesting opportunity to, to study how evolutionary pathways are modified. So basically, what the, for the remainder of the, the, the remaining two par, uh, parts of this lecture, what I'd like to do is focus on those questions. I'd like to talk a little bit about how it is that um, this Bicoid gradient is established. What have we been able to learn by applying biophysical techniques to the establishment of uh, to fly embryos to figure out how molecules move and how stable are the actual patterns of, of, of Bicoid uh, in the embryo? Is it stable enough to provide information that cells can make choices? And then in the very last part, I'd like to speculate a little bit and tell you a little bit more about our experiments on evolution. Thank you. <laughs>